what makes you female is having these um, large sessile gametes, and what makes you male is having these small zippy gametes. Um, but very often when humans, especially modern humans, talk about it, um, they talk about being XX or XY, right? They talk about the chromosomes. And in humans, as the vast majority of mammals, there being a few very weird exceptions at the base of the mammal tree, the monotremes, the echidnas, and the, and the duck-billed platypus, which have like, God, what is it, like 10 or 12 pairs of sex chromosomes? It's crazy. I thought it was five, but... Anyway, maybe it's, it's five and they got ten yeah. in pairs. I like I I don't actually remember. Um, and it's various. It's variable between the three or five species, depending on how many echidnas you think there are. Anyway, um, <laughs> the marsupials um, and the placental mammals, the two other major groups of mammals, um, which are basically every mammal that you can think of that's not an echidna or a duckbill platypus. Not basically that is everything. Have uh, what's called genetic sex determination, which means that we have all of us, um, a pair of chromosomes. And if a pair of sex chromosomes, as opposed to all the other autosomes that we have, and it's variable between species, like um, you know, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and that 23rd one is the sex chromosomes. Chimps, and I think bonobos, um, who are together our closest living relatives, have, is it 24? And their diploid number is 48, or is it 22? I think it's different it's than definitely ours. One off. But I don't remember which way it is. Yeah. I think, I think it's one more. I, th I, I, I think correctly. so too, but I don't I don't totally remember. So, you know, and, and there's gonna be, I'm sure there's other mammals out there whose haploid number, who's, you know, the, how many how many pairs of chromosomes do you have is 23 like ours. Um, and um, they aren't gonna be as closely related to us as um, as the chimps and bonobos. And so in in us in chimps, in giraffes, in kangaroos, in wombats, in sperm whales, even female sperm whales, um, there is a pair of sex chromosomes. And if you have two X's, then you're female. Um, and if you have an X and a Y, then you're male. But it's not that um, that is what underlyingly makes you female, it's that's what determines your sex. Okay, So in mammals, we have XX determines that you will become female absent other weird developmental things that might happen. And if you're XY, that, that, the position at that last set of chromosomes determines what sex you are. There are other species, there are other clades that have um, genetic sex determination, uh, birds famously, but in birds it's the opposite. And so we use, um, we use different letters, we use Ws and Zs, but whereas in mammals, females are the homogametic sex, meaning we have two, two Xs as opposed to the heterogametic sex for males, an X and a Y, in birds, uh, females are heterogametic. And they have a Y and a Z, and uh, males are homogametic, and they don't. I don't remember, never remember if it's two Ws or two Zs, whatever. Um, and that actually has um, some interesting implications for how their ecology plays out. But they still have genetic sex determination. Whereas, and we're just sticking to vertebrates here. There's lots of species of vertebrates that don't have genetic sex determination at all. That don't appear to have anything in their chromosomes that says, "Aha, got it. I'm going to set you down the path to being male or female." They have some form of environmental sex determination. So, um, in many oviparous species, for instance, that is um, egg-laying species, as opposed to viviparous species like us who, who give live birth, you have um, the temperature of the egg at a critical moment in development that determines what sex you will be, which means at the point that that egg is laid, it is still open. You still could become male or female, but any individual that kind of doesn't become one or the other isn't viable, is an evolutionary dead end. And so just a few examples in tortoises, males develop, um, males develop from eggs that were in that critical period at low temperatures and females at higher temperatures. In many lizards and alligators, it's the opposite. Females develop at the lower temperatures and males at the higher temperatures. And in crocodiles and snapping turtles, both cool and warm temperatures during that critical period during egg development um, turn into females, whereas it's the intermediate temperatures that produce males. So there's all sorts of ways to determine whether or not you, some developing embryo, are going to become male or female. And in species with environmental sex determination, uh, there, you know, th things like if you live in a place that is warming, you might suddenly have a population crash because now you've got all females or all males. This is going to be a problem. Whereas for organisms like mammals and birds with genetic sex determination and a few other and several other species as well, um, the 
the temperature at which we are incubated doesn't seem to matter. And of course, with mammals, we've, we're endotherms and we have viviparity. Um, and so we've got this constant internal um, gestational environment. But for, for birds who do lay eggs, um, yes, mama and depending on species, papa birds sit on the eggs and keep them warm. But that keeping them warm doesn't change what sex they are because that's already on board in their genetics. So all of these things are true and none of it changes the underlying thing, which is that whether or not you got there because you developed cool, you developed hot, you had an XX, you had a ZW, if as an adult you are capable of producing large sessile gametes, you are female. And if as an adult you are capable of producing small zippy gametes, you are male. And that cannot be changed. All right. Now I want to add the thing that I think is most surprising on top of all of that really shocking stuff that you just laid out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Imagine that you walk into a forest, right? Imagine that you exist 5,000 years ago before we understood any of this, right? Or imagine you landed on this planet from somewhere else. Okay. It sounds like fun. And you walk into a forest and you find animals of some type, what we would call a species. And some of these animals are behaving in a way that is finicky about who to have sex with. And some other animals are enthusiastic to have sex with whichever ones will have them, right? And you said, okay, I know nothing about these creatures or how they work, but I'll bet you those ones that are finicky have big gametes. And I bet you that the ones that are... Uh, hot to trot, irrespective of the qualities of the other, have small motile gametes. You'll almost always be right, right? And the reason for this is that, let's walk back a little bit. So presumably the initial condition is when gametes, so you have uh, asexual creatures that don't make gametes at all. There's an advantage to uh, fusing two half genomes together, right? We can debate about what that is, and it's actually not entirely certain. It's a little harder to come up with a robust argument for why the uh, genetic variation that comes from sexual reproduction is a good thing. We'll go into that some other day. But for the moment, let's just say that there's a reason that uh, natural selection invents sexual reproduction repeatedly. It's not for all creatures, but for many creatures, it appears to be essential. Um, so selection invents this thing. Presumably when it first does, you get two gametes that are the same size, right? Um, we would call that isogamous gametes. Now isogamous gametes is a stable equilibrium. It's an unstable equilibrium, which means that you can't tell which way it's going to go, but it can't stay where it is because as soon as one type of creature starts cheaping out on how much it invests in these gametes. The other one can't cheap out in response. It actually has to overinvest. And so what you see... The additional problem, well, two additional problems, are the reason for one of the sets of gametes to be large is because you can't make a baby just with uh, DNA. Right. right. You need the cytoplasmic structure, the cellular machinery, and someone's got to bring that. And if you both bring it, if both male and female bring it, they're going to argue, actually, right? They're going to argue about whose cellular machinery to use. Maybe. And and in part because there is mitochondrial DNA, right? There's actual genetic material yep. in some of the cytoplasm. And then also, if you're both kind of move, kind of middling size and kind of both have some cytoplasm, then when you get together, you might argue about whose mitochondria to use. Um, you're also both kind of slow, and lumpy, and you're going to have a harder time finding one another. So exactly as you say, there's an unstable... Um, there's an unstable equilibrium. And so an unstable equilibrium is kind of an, uh, a hard concept to grasp because... Um, let's think about it this way. If you did a computer model of what happens if you put a marble, a perfect marble, on in, exactly in the center, balanced on the head of a perfect pin, right? The computer will tell you that the marble doesn't do anything. It doesn't fall off. Why? Because it doesn't know which way to fall off. It's equally likely to fall off in all ways, which holds it right there. Now, in our experience, this never happens, 
because there are no perfect marbles, there are no perfect pins, and there is no perfectly stable environment where you won't have the tiniest bit of wind or the tiniest shaking of the earth that will cause it to be slightly more this way than that way. And once it's slightly more this way than that way, then it goes that direction. So the point is the equilibrium is a technical fact. Can I have Zach show sure. this while you're talking? Sure. So this is uh, a figure from Daly and Wilson's book from the 1980s uh, called The Evolution of Sex and Behavior, I believe. And this is, uh, my computer is playing funny games. Um, and it's gonna be it's gonna be small for you guys, but um, it, it describes the both the unstable and the stable equilibrium, the unstable equilibrium of isogamy, in which gametes are um, the same size and both have arguments about, about mitochondrial DNA and have a hard time finding one another, and the anisogamy, the unequal sized and um, sort of structured gametes um, that results that is a stable equilibrium. All right. So equal sized gametes is the initial starting condition. It in immediately breaks apart in favor of a small motile and a large sessile gamete. But the crazy part is once that happens, and it doesn't matter how many times this process happens where selection favors sexual reproduction, produces equal sized gametes, and then the unstable equilibrium breaks apart and creates one uh, subtype that makes large gametes and one subtype that makes small gametes. Every time that happens, maleness and femaleness follow, right? That is to say the characteristics that cause the, you know, the behaviors of these creatures follow because once you're stuck with one of these kind of gametes, certain things make sense from the point of view of selection and other things don't make sense. And so... Well, I guess I'd like for you to be... Uh, I, I think I want you to correct your language there a little bit. The state of having a small zippy gamete is the state of being male. The state of having a large sessile gamete is the state of being female. The software that follows the behavior for animals, the behavioral manifestation, the choosiness, the displayiness, the, you know, and all of these things that follow are, for lack of better terms, perhaps the typically feminine, the typically masculine. It's not the femaleness or the maleness. The femaleness and the maleness exist, and they do not change based on how it is that those organisms will later behave. It, let's put it this way. I agree with your correction, but it's not even software, right? Because we see it in plants where there is no software, right? It's the behavior. And no, this is this, this. You're the one who wants to call it software. I, well, I'm always the one calling it behavior, and you say software is the more inclusive term that includes plants. Because I wouldn't say that plants have a gender. So the, where we where we usually get into this is what's the definition of gender, and I say it's the software of sex, right? In a plant, and you know, the point I love to make is that even in a plant that is a, a hermaphrodite that has both a male and female, hermaphrodite. right? Pr that produces both. Actually, I don't think there are sequential hermaphrodites in plants, are there? Uh, kind of, at, at least kind of, because there are plants that avoid self-fertilization by the gametes maturing. So it, it's oh, a different, it's, but, but yeah, it's, a sort of it's short very time different scale. than the way animals do it, but a very short time scale, and yeah. like per flower. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, the point is, even in a flower that has both male and female parts. Right? The female parts are reluctant about sex and they put the male parts through a test, right? A long corolla tube that the pollen grains have to grow down in order to reach the eggs. Whereas the pollen grains are totally hot to trot and they are not discriminating, right? So in a plant that is wind dispersed, it'll produce lots of pollen, it lands anywhere, it tries to fertilize whatever it lands on. Um, the male uh, plant parts will hire insects to carry their, you know, to carry the the pollen grains out to to female plants, but it's always male insects because they're also the ones who are easily fooled because they're so eager for sex. Well, actually, it's not because it's bees. Yeah, uh, in, in, you're talking about uh, the the orchid like cases. hawk moths and such. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, the point is the enthusiasm for sex with strangers tracks the gamete size, even though presumably this has nothing to do with shared ancestry between animals and plants, because I don't even think the common ancestor of these two things had sexual reproduction, right? No, no, they, they, they probably, they did. Um, so sex evolves, um, Oh, I'm gonna have to. I'd, I'd have to go back and. and it's look gonna be sure. some yeast-like colonial something or other, right? Um. 
Well, I mean, it evolves a few, six evolves a few times. Yep. But in the lineage that, you know, when I say definitely back 500 million years, yep. um, we can track that and maybe up to 2 billion years. There's, you know, there's a lot that happens in that 1 to 2 billion year space. And I'm not sure how precise we can be about exactly when that was and therefore when uh, in the branching between plants and animals that was. I, I'm actually not sure. Okay. Yeah. But the overarching point on which I know we agree yep. is that it is the constraints of the mode of reproduction that cause the behavior to become what it is, which then in creatures like us becomes a software program that uh, is gender. But, yeah. but the point is the behavior precedes there being any software involved at all. It's just a set of strategies that make sense if you are the small gamete producing type versus a set of strategies that make sense if you are the large gamete producing type, which means that male and female have a meaning in the universe beyond something beyond the gametes. It's mm -hmm. the strategy that follows from the gametes, right? This couldn't have less to do with people, right? And people are in, in a sense interesting because uh, in the, sense. the software is partially sex role reversed in us, right? A, both males and females are choosy, right? That exists in other creatures, but we are asymmetrically choosy. We choose for different things, which is pretty interesting. Um, and the ornamented both display, yeah, yeah. The ornamented sex is female, right? Typically, if you find a displaying bird or spider or something like this, that's the male, right? And so, the it's not that these things don't get changed around, but the basic logic of choosiness isn't uh, yep. inverted. And even as the software changes and the rules change, and even if they didn't, we're just talking about averages and there's plenty of masculine acting women and feminine acting men, it does not change the underlying sex that they are. It does not. It does not. Now, the last point I would make is And then that I want to talk about oikos a little bit, just a little bit more on this topic. All right. Yeah. Um, the, the last point that I wanted to make is that the basic underlying logic of basically males with their small gametes are hot to trot because they're investing less in offspring gets changed, especially in something it gets changed in any creature where there is teaming up on raising offspring because because the point is the logic is uh, um, unmade it, to the extent that males are cheating on investment by producing small gametes that contain very little, as soon as males are forced to invest, then they view the world in a way that is more symmetrical to the way females naturally so view it. You would get more symmetry in those species, but you would also have <clears throat> species with sex role reversal where you have um, something about the ecological conditions has created a system in which males are investing more than females. So something like polyandrous birds, like jacanas, uh, or sea heaths. <laughs> sea heath, which is our family term for seahorses, mm -hmm. um, where males are, they do produce the smaller gametes, hence they're being males, but they engage in the pregnancy. They And they really, I mean, I actually wrote a piece on my Substack about this, um, and I, I had not, I had not known to what degree we understood the level of um, analogy to uh, to mammalian pregnancy mm -hmm. that male seahorses have. I mean, the 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 cardiovascular and I believe neurological, but certainly cardiovascular integration of the fetus um, with the father's body is extraordinary in seahorses. They really, really, yeah, it's it's they are actually pregnant, and obviously, you know, the egg didn't come from them, so they brought this in, but then it embeds in a way that is extraordinarily like pregnancy. All right, so yeah. the the way you'll understand the point if this but makes, still males. if this makes sense to you, <laughs> there are things about the interaction between the baby seahorses and their father, who is male because of the gametes that he produces, mm -hmm. that are beyond what you will understand that are beyond what we understand that are likely beyond what we will ever scientifically understand about the system. However, the um, underlying logic of the system is relatively easy to understand, which is if you're going to invest, you're going to be choosing, right? Yes. That's the driving force. And the point yes. is it takes no complexity to see it, right? Yeah. And just, just think that through. Just think like, okay. If I'm going to invest, am I going to take everything that comes at me in any context at all? 
Like, no, if you're going to invest, you're going to be choosy. Right. There it is. And so to the extent that you have sophists arguing that, um, you know, it's the patriarchy that uh, caused women to be reluctant about casual sex, just think it through for yourself. No freaking way. Right. Yep. The fact is, if having sex is going to stick you with a an offspring that you're going to carry with you for nine months, give birth to, and then have to take care of very intensively for, you know, six, seven, eight years. And then, you know, to some extent until it's 15, 16, 17 years of age, right? You don't want to produce such a thing willy nilly, and you don't want to produce it without an agreement uh, to co-parent if such an agreement is a possibility. So hence, females will be coy about sex, yeah. right? That has nothing to do with the patriarchy, right? In fact, the patriarchy protects women because, you know, both men and women have an interest in the women in their group being protected from men who would inseminate them and run off. Um, there's plenty of places where the patriarchy, which is not a word I tend to use, um, does not protect women at all or very well. And one of one of those places is <laughs> another boy I heard from um, uh, is with what's happening now with regard to our apparent inability to understand what women are, which is thus allowing men to claim that they're women and to beat women in sports, which is a much, you know, it's it, it's it's both important and not nearly as important as the fact that once you have that, then you start letting men into women's prisons and, uh, and you know, and, and everywhere else, like all the dominoes fall. 